Okay, so today we're going to talk about um, the valuable role, which I've already talked about a little bit, and I have a few more messages for you. I'm going to um, introduce you to the resources that we make available. To, to you and to consumers. I'm going to talk a little bit about some services that we provide that go beyond just the basic credit report. Uh, Touch on the business credit versus uh, consumer credit because I understand that some of you are in the business loan side of the business and I just want you to, uh, I have more but I, I only stuck in a slide just to touch on that. A quick overview of the basic consumer presentation which um, I, I think got handed out or is in your, your program and I'll talk about that. Um, scores from the consumer perspective and this is probably the heart of my presentation because it used to be in my Ask Max column or the Ask Experian column I would get questions about if I do this how will that affect my credit report now consumers are savvy enough that they're now saying if I do this how will it affect my credit score so the language has changed and it's a lot more complicated than than you think even though everybody wants it to be simple and some parts are more simple than consumers think but it, it's complicated so I want you to have good messaging around that. Um, some other key consumer messages and then challenging questions. I have a lot of those so if we don't get through all that we can we can see pick, pick and choose which ones we want to talk about. Um, just talk a little bit about trying the trainer opportunities which I've already talked about and head right into it. So this is kind of a little bit of a clunky slide but I had it made up with that whole theme of I want consumers to understand that one, credit is a privilege. It's not just a guaranteed right that that you you are supposed to have credit. And it's something that we enjoy in America that most countries don't enjoy. Um, many countries don't have credit uh, reporting at all. And many, even some really big ones, only have negative credit reporting. So if you have good credit, I mean, that's not captured um, and because of that their interest rates are instead of three percent mortgages or four percent mortgages you know they have twenty percent mortgages or forty percent mortgages home ownership therefore is out of reach for many of them especially look at Mexico to the south and what what they go through so all of that's a privilege and and it it's almost necessary for the American way of life because without credit you know we don't we have trouble getting that house that car that college education so um, so so that's how I want people to to recognize that they need to learn about credit because it is something that's important in their lives I hear parents brag all the time about I don't let my kid use credit I got him a debit card and he's not going to use he's not going to go away to college and get that credit card that those bad in banks come on campus and tempt them with a t-shirt and you know all those things although now there's a law of course that's supposed to try to to limit that and I just think that is I mean I think it was a well-intentioned law and I think there were some extremes where kids were being tempted and not being taught at the same time but that, that to me is like trying to, to protect your child from drowning by not teaching them to swim because at some point they need to get into the water. So what we have now is we have a whole generation of young people who are graduating from college and in the same way that they need those academic credentials, they need the diploma, they need the employment references, they need credit references because suddenly they're out of college with a degree and they're still having to ask mommy and daddy to sign on their apartment lease. They're still having to ask mommy and daddy to sign on their car loan because they haven't established those credit references which are as, as important in life as any of those other credentials. So the, my message is that you build a positive credit history so that you can get the best terms when you invest in debt. And now that may not be a popular term to those of you who work in your bank card division um, because I know you make a lot of money on, your, on the interest that you charge or finance charges when people revolve. But my message to consumers is don't revolve. If you are revolving, you are spending more than you make. And that part of why credit has gotten such a negative um, image and you know people go credit and like shudder like oh bad credit is because they use their credit cards to spend more than they can ma they make so what I my message is a credit card is for convenience and possibly to earn points and miles and use your money for a month before I have to pay so I get to ride the float I get all the advantages of credit but it's not debt 
you know, if you pay in full every month, then what you're doing is you're building those references and you're not accumulating debt so that then you can invest in debt. Now, okay, so you may be mad at me for saying that, but it's sort of like curing world hunger. Even though I say it and I want you to say it, the reality is there's still going to be enough of your customers who are going to revolve despite what I say. So I don't think I'm hurting your revenue, but, um, but I do think... Oh, good. Okay, good, good. And I, and, and I say that to my audiences, too, because quite honestly, there are probably some of you in here who revolve, and I'm just saying that's the most expensive debt you can carry, and that's just not a smart thing. You just need to do whatever it takes to get that revolving debt paid off and so that you can start um, using credit for convenience and invest in debt. So that's part of what I hope that you will come out of this today, too, is that you, too, have a really positive message to your customers, that you can help them open that credit card account. You can help them open that first auto loan account or whatever you do, and that when you do that, um, they need to understand how important it is that they make their payments because you're helping them build the credit references that they need for the rest of their life. So. Um, we're all in this together. Okay, um, in the packet that you have are most of these materials. The, the brochure that we use most often as a handout are, is called 12 Common Questions About Consumer Credit and Direct Marketing. I have that in both English and Spanish. If you have, uh, have a Spanish audience, uh, just let me know and we can provide those. Um, the second most um, uh, one that we use the most often is called Credit Score Basics. And I would encourage you to at least invest some time in looking through that, and not while, we're, while I'm talking today, but, but uh, later, because that, that kind of gets at the heart of the whole that scores are more than just one score thing that it's so important for consumers to understand. Um, there, we started a, a series we call the Credit Crossroads, sort of based around life events, because oftentimes it's hard to get consumers' attention about their credit report until they're in need. And so we have one about home buying, we have one for divorce, which isn't the largest um, issue for consumers in, in terms of volume of consumers who are affected by it, but it's the most heartbreaking because many times, and it's gotten a little better, but many times um, even attorneys are not good to help consumers understand that that divorce decree is between the two of you and has nothing to do with your contract with your lenders. So, so I get the calls from the, you know, the, the divorced person saying, I've paid all my bills all my life and now he's ruined my credit because he stopped paying for the truck he was supposed to pay for after the divorce or vice versa. And, and you know, they think they're doing all the right things and they just, um, they get hurt in the end. Uh, new credit for e both young people and for people new to credit, you know, the underbanked, unbanked, the people new to, um, th to the U.S who haven't used credit in their past. Uh, reports on credit are like one-page things, and I did not, uh, I don't think I put those in your photo, but they're one-page front and back on 10 different topics. And then we have a fraud prevention that talks about if consumers are a victim of fraud, how do they get assistance, how do they put on a security alert, how do they put on a victim alert, et cetera. And then, oh, backing up, this mini disc, that, it, that has, all, I've, I've given you printed copies of most of those brochures. The mini disc is just a URL. If you put that in, it will give you access to PDF copies of all those. So you can print off, they're not you know, brochures, but they're eight and a half by 11. So if you need handouts for anything to one of your customers or your kids or your class or your family or whatever, you can just go in and print your own without even having to ask um, me. I can provide them if you're doing a group in small quantities, but quite honestly, I can't provide huge quantities of them. Um, but I'll be happy to help you out if you if you need some. Um, we have 33 videos. They're mostly of me, um, but but they're very short and will answer questions like what is credit and why do I need it, or you know uh, what is a good credit score and things like that. So if you have um, young people, especially who only want to look at a video and don't want to have to read anything, we try to keep them really short. Um, to go in there, and that, by the way, that's very painful being videoed <laughs> and watching yourself. Um, we had a, we did things like credit town halls, and we have a credit chat every Wednesday at two o'clock Central Time. If you're interested in um, in joining us for that, would love to have you 
answer questions as U.S. Bank and uh, and chime in. We're, we're getting every every week our um, our audience is growing and our our, um, our links are growing. So feel, feel free to join in. Okay. Uh, other resources, the annualcreditreport.com, hopefully you know that. That's not our resource, that's a joint resource. It was legislated by Congress that we had to have a central source for everyone to go to to get their credit report. They didn't want us to want consumers to come to us individually for some reason, which is c very confusing to consumers. But, um, but anyway, that is the only place that they get their free annual report. Um, at Experian, we have, if you go to Experian.com, you can click on what, the tab at the top that's credit education, or you can go directly to the link uh, credit education and a lot of our materials, and that's where the videos are and those, those kind of things. We also have a website called Live Credit Smart, um, and, and part of that's because when talking with the media, sometimes they're a little resistant to when you say, go to our website, because you know, our website has sell sites and lots of other stuff, and they wanted something more direct, so we created this and we do things like state of credit, which I think, I, yeah, state of credit, where we do average credit scores across the nation in the largest metropolitan areas. And Texas, where I'm from, and you know, has like four cities in the bottom 10. We're like really, really, I have job security there, nothing else. Um, Minneapolis often is number one. Uh, I think your state is, is pretty good too, but you should check it out on state of credit. Um, this this is the uh, mini disc URL, but you have it on the mini disc. If you lose your mini disc, that's that. And then um, I hand I gave Brenda this morning a Vantage Score white paper. I don't know if y'all are even are, do y'all know Vantage Score? Are you familiar with Vantage Score? Okay, well, let me give you the background on it. Uh, you know, FICO is the historic score developing company that's been around for a long time. Um, Several years ago, the three credit reporting companies went together and created a new company and created a competitive scoring model, uh, three scoring models at this point, and it's called Vantage Score. So it's another score developing company like FICO is a score developing company. And um, they do a lot of um, um, white papers and other education material that I find really, really helpful. And this one in particular has charts that are like if I miss a payment, what's going to be the impact of that? If I file for bankruptcy, what's going to be the impact of that? And, and it gives ranges, because obviously it varies depending on your credit report and how much other stuff is in there and which scoring model is used and all those things which we're going to cover lately, uh, later, I'm sorry. But, um, but definitely, um, Brenda, I think, is going to either scan it in and make it available to you electronically or, or distribute copies in some way. But check out some of that information. It also, um, the other thing it has is how long it takes you to recover. If you do file for uh, foreclosure, how long? If I keep using credit, will my score get back to where it was? Things like that, which are very helpful and, and, and encouraging to consumers that you're not doomed. Um, freecreditscore.com is our sell site. That's where we do our credit monitoring. That's the band, and you remember the band? And um, we get, we've gotten quite a bit of negative um, comment about that we're trying to confuse consumers because we call it freecreditscore.com. So consumers think that's where they go for their annual credit report and then they sign up and they get charged. Well, I, you put your credit card in, how did you not read that you were gonna get charged? But, um, but in their defense, we had that site four years before the annual credit report was required. So we did not create, we definitely created it to encourage consumers, tempt consumers to come there and check it out. We did not create it to confuse them with the required annual credit report that's free, okay? And it's one of the best education tools I have because I have a tiny little budget. They have a big budget because they sell and they can advertise and so they have the band and now when I go and talk to students, the, the, parent, the teachers say, you know, it used to be terrible and like nobody wanted to pay attention to their credit report. Now they go, Oh yeah, credit report. That's the, I better pay attention because I don't want to live in my mother-in-law's basement and I don't want to work in a fast food restaurant and it, that's all the commercials helping me educate. Um, Protect My ID is another service they have. Auto check, more and more consumers because cars are lasting longer are buying used cars, huge, more and more uh, 
uh, used car market, and also consumers are buying online now, and auctions and whatever. And so more important than ever that they get an auto history report. And what's good about the Experian one is that um, it also scores the car, because just because you have a, you know, 19, 89 Buick or whatever, you don't really know what condition that car is in compared to others. Well, it, it, it will rate your car compared to others of like, like a mo makes and models. Um, another service that we just started, remember I talked about CROA and that we fall under CROA? We're trying to get that changed legislatively. Banks don't. You can coach consumers and charge them for it. We can't. But we started a service because we had such demand for it. Um, that people didn't want us just to disclose the credit report. They wanted us to tell them about it. What, you know, what, not what, just what's on there, but what does that score mean? What should I do differently so that I can improve my score? By the way, the number one searches on January 1 are, is not just uh, how can I lose weight, it's also how can I repair my credit or how can I improve my score? Um, so we have a service where um, you can set up an appointment three days out to follow the CROA laws and it's $29.99 and we truly go through every step of um, the credit report, the scores, as long as the consumer wants and we get absolutely rave reviews about it. And we, uh, we also set it up through our clients, so like U.S. Bank, if you wanted to, if you have, you know, if you, in your mortgage division or your, your auto loan division or your however y'all are set up, if you have uh, consumers that you are close but you can't quite loan to them or if you are uh, uh, wanting to get a better rate, you can connect them up, get discounted uh, services for this and help them, you know, say, ch change the way you use credit and come back in six months and we can really give you a great deal. Uh, Score Planner is, um, is uh, recently introduced, and this is on the freecreditscore.com site. This is where you can put in, like, here are the questions. What if I pay down my balances? What if I close my account? And they, these, there are new uh, commercials out there. Have any of you seen them about, like, hmm, wonder what this, this slider does. They have sliders. Wonder what this slider does, and suddenly Brett Michaels is playing in your living room, or suddenly they're in a bowl of guacamole. Any of you seen these? Okay, well, they're a little, little, uh, little different, <laughs> but they're actually winning awards for those commercials. Well, that's the new, the, the new score planner tool. It comes free with the membership if you are a, um, a credit monitoring uh, subscriber, but if you aren't, uh, a member and aren't paying, you can load your own data in. Uh, you can you know, get the free credit report from annualcreditreport.com and go in and just plug in some key information and play around with it yourself. So uh, you might want to check that out. Okay, uh, the other thing that, that we have that's unique is that we collect rental data. 31% of the U.S. population does not own a home they rent. and yeah, I was talking about how important it is to have a credit history, one of your most valuable uh, financial tools. Those people don't, well, oftentimes don't have an opportunity to create that credit history. Um, so we now, uh, we, we purchased a company called Rent Bureau, so you'll, that's the connection why you'll hear it called Rent Bureau. They collect positive and negative data, but they only transfer at this point the, the positive data to the credit report. So, um, so you will see that there, and we just uh, and what's happened, we got tests not only of how many become scorable, but also how many consumers are able to raise their scores. So if you've got someone who has messed up in their past and they're trying to recover, you can uh, encourage them to get their rent reported. Now we started, of course, there's millions of, of rent, uh, lease holders that obviously we can't get all that data. So we've only, we started with like. 8,000 of the biggest property management companies. But now, the new thing is that we have two companies, ClearNow and William Paid, that, that small one, one house uh, renters can get their data reported. Um, it's like $15 for the first, first uh, consumer and then small add-on two or three dollars for each additional one. And why would a landlord want to invest $15 of his rent to, to get that service? Because it, 
it encourages everybody to pay and pay on time. So it's sort of a like pre-collection tool in and of itself. And from the consumer standpoint, you can encourage your landlord to do that. So I mean, because because it is good for both of them. And you, it, as a consumer, you can opt you opt in and you can opt out. So if you don't, if you know that you're getting in trouble and you're not going to be able to pay your rent, you can say, I don't want my my rent. Pay, rental payment reported anymore okay so when it's reported to us then it comes on on the credit report as an installment loan for what it's I think it's like 12 months of their contract and so it becomes an installment loan it's a great credit reference and it helps those people build their credit history that don't have one raise scores that don't have one it is not yet scored by FICO it's only scored by Vantage score at this point so look for that we're hoping it will evolve over time but the other thing is if someone is um, applying for a mortgage and you have to pull out all your rental history take it in and whatever it, it will be there on the credit report for review, uh, especially for mortgage purposes or anyone who looks at the credit report. Um, business and credit, I told you I was going to touch on this for those of you who do business loans. My most important message here, by the way, we have a business credit division that yes, it is in competition to Dunn and Bradstreet. <laughs> Everybody only knows Dunn and Bradstreet, but we're, we're also there. Um, and, and better, of course, but we have, um, we do business, credit reporting but the most important message for consumers which is where I'm coming from is that you know America rides on the backs of our small businesses there are so many people who get started in, with small businesses well the way you get started in a small business is with a a loan based on your personal credit so when I say you know use credit for convenience and build your references so you can invest in debt this is another investment that many consumers make and um, and they need so they need their strong personal credit report and the reason that many businesses um, not only check need to check personal credit and business credit when you have a business loan is that um, I don't know if you can read it, but obviously most people are good, which is good. But if they're going to go bad, this is a little bit of an older study, but it still applies. Eight percent, well, the, the owner, the, uh, the personal credit will go bad first. The business credit will still look fine, but the personal credit will go bad. And just the opposite, uh, in some cases, the business will go bad and the personal credit will still look fine. So you really need to pull both of those reports if you're, and monitor both of those reports if you're in business um, loans. Okay, so this is, um, I'm entering the phase of the presentation. This is the highlights from our basic, it's called Give Me a Little Credit. Um, presentation that when you go out on our, our education site and you'll see give me a little credit there's a, a plain version and a student version I copied the whole thing for you I think it's in your your packet and you'll see that there are talk notes there so when I say please go out and speak to your school speak to your uh, employees speak to your relatives whatever you don't even have to know anything all you have to do is read the talk notes and once again if you see anything there that you have suggestions about we're very open to that I'm, I don't I'm not going to go through the whole thing for you some of it you might uh, you might know but I would encourage you to at least look through that after today and and um, and, and get familiar with the, the whole presentation but you know part of it is that we start off with that whole concept of you know credit is not a bad thing how you use it is can be a bad thing or a good thing and the choice is yours we cover the three credit reporting companies, although there are others that are keep, uh, we think are close to, to joining in that national site where we have to give the free report. Like CoreLogic, I think, has applied to, to be one of the ones to provide a free report. They, they do mortgage reports and you know, use base credit reports and enhance them or whatever they do. I'm not even really sure, but, but those are the three basic credit reporting companies, but that's not all that consumers will hear about, and that's the reason uh, I want you covered. And then the other thing you know, we cover is don't forget that because you have a credit report, you, know, you, have, you can get instant credit, you can get lower cost credit, you get nationwide credit, you, uh, widespread availability, and then also account management so that, that not only our businesses are protected from taking on bad debt, they also can take early action to keep consumers from getting into trouble, which is good for everybody. Um, I cover the, the credit cycle so that consumers understand that it's all 
a part of what they do and they have choices about it. I get letters from to, to ask experience saying, I don't want you to have a credit report on me. I don't want a credit report. And I go, you know, fine, don't use credit. That's all it takes. But if you do use credit, it is also uh, um, allowed that other lenders have a right not only a, a physical responsibility right, but also a legal right to review your references. So it's not like you can say, no one else can review my references. If you use credit, you have a legal right to review those references. Don't want a credit report? Don't ever open an account, pay cash, you'll, you'll never have a credit report. It's not something that's automatically, when you're born, somebody sets up a credit report on you, you know, or you get a social security number, suddenly there's a credit report. Doesn't happen unless the consumer initiates it. And then, you know, we, the lender updates the records, they share it, so our role is that we store those records and keep them ready when, the, when you wanted to um, apply for additional services. The other thing I really stress is the you part. You know, that this isn't something that's done to you. This is something that's done with you. You're an important part of it. And that's why we really encourage everyone to go and get their annual credit report. Because people will say to me, uh, why would you put my social security number on someone else's report? And we're like, well, how do we know it's not their social security number on your report? We don't know who really owns that social security number. You, the way it gets to us is it's filled out on an application, it's sent in with the account by your lender. We don't have a cross-reference, you know, some magic um, book that we can go to and the social security number, uh, social security administration won't verify uh, social securities for us. We've really, really tried that. Um, so we, we, lenders have to take what social security number you provide. We have to take what social security number then your lenders provide to us. So we don't know which is the right one. That's why it's so important for you to go and check your credit report at least once a year and help everybody make sure that it's right because we all want accurate information. Same thing with, you know, addresses. You have average consumer, what, 14, 15 different accounts. So that means we get 14, 15 different versions of your a name, address, social security number perhaps, if there's a transposition or a, can't read that, whether that's a nine or a seven or whatever. Um, so it's not unusual for there to be variations in name and address. And when, people, when consumers talk about accuracy, and they get so upset about credit reports not being accurate, that's often what they're talking about is that, well, you, you know, you spell my name M-A-X-E-N-E. -E. Now that's stupid. Well, that's how it got sent to us and that's how it's linked to your account. And so it's not inaccurate, it's an accurate reporting of how that information is being reported. So, um, so in some cases you want to get that, that straightened up but you don't want to break your link to your account. So it's important that we show all of that so consumers can, if there is a problem, we can say, oh, well the reason it's a problem is because the name is not spelled correctly or the social is not correct and we haven't connected, we haven't linked it to the right person. Um, so anyway, the you part is very important. Uh, we cover in there the, the permissible purposes, and, and they do go beyond you know, just granting of credit. However, the first two, the opening accounts and then the offers of credit, the pre-approved offers, those account for more than 90% of the volume. So by far, you know, most transactions are related to that. Um, you hear a lot about employment purposes, but that's a very small percentage of the use for credit reports. Um, the other part of that you with consumers is, um, is I, I, J.C. Penney's has a headquarters close to us, so I called a friend over there and said, could you send me some applications so that I can show examples of how, wh how um, wrong social security numbers or misspellings of name get in our files? And he said, well, how many do you want? And I said, well, just one afternoon, just set them aside, the ones, and make copies of the ones that you can't read, your people can't read. He sent me a stack like this. He said, you know, we can't read something on about 50% of the applications we get. Now, most, a lot of applications are done online today, so some of this has gone away, but not completely. And this is, this is not at all unusual for what those, you know, the people have to, to type in, and it fully explains why there are sometimes misspellings or wrong names uh, on your credit report. 
Uh, the number one thing I wanted to cover about initiating a dispute, and it's probably the number one complaint about our customer service, is that it's hard to speak with someone. And remember I told you that back when I ran the center, I started a, a toll-free service. And I, I, what happened is the consumers all just called wanting us to take their information to request the report. And so we weren't really customer service people, we were order takers. And that's not where I needed to be spending my time with consumers. And also what would happen is they would call and they would want to dispute something and they would get very upset with us because they would be looking at your version of the credit report that you got from Experian and it would be in your, um, your format. So they would be saying, you know, it's the, and consumers don't understand that, that not everybody's credit report doesn't, you know, even though it might have the same information, it can be in totally different formats. Some, some creditors want all the negative information first, some want all the, the bank cards first, you know, whatever. You, you, you control, you can change how you want your format. Okay, so they're holding your report and they're going, I want to dispute that account. And we're like, well, we're not seeing that account. And they're like, it's the second one down, you know, why, why are you so blind, you can't see the second account. Well, you know, multiple things could happen. One, they could be looking at an Equifax report or a TransUnion report and not an Experian report, and we might not even have the account. Or it could be, you know, like your version, and, and we would have it, but it would be like the last account. Um, anyway, it was a very unpleasant customer service experience for all of us. Or it would be a six month old report, that's the other thing that would happen, and the data would be updated and totally not that way anymore. So we just set the requirement that we'll, we're happy to talk to consumers. All we ask is that you get your credit report from us first. You can get it from the annualcreditreport.com or if you've been declined, or, or had adverse action, they raised, uh, y'all raised their limit, I mean raised their um, finance charge or any kind of adverse action, they can get a free report from Experian at Report Access. They also can get a free report if they uh, are a victim of fraud, if they are unemployed seeking employment, or if they're on um, public welfare or government assistance programs. So most cases you can get a free report without having to pay for it. And that's all we ask. If you'll just start with that report, then we can have such a better, more positive customer service experience with you as a consumer. And when you get that report, it's gonna have the phone number for where you can call and talk to us. But we don't, we ask that you not, not call the general number and expect to talk to someone until you've got that report number. Okay, so if you can help us get that message out to consumers, it's not that we don't want to talk to them, it's just we want them to have the report from us first. Um, so, some, I'm trying to think if I have, I think I have that later. I might not, let me go back to it. Uh, some of the things to know about our customer service department too is that um, we constantly are working at making the customer service experience better. Remember me talking about how we started with the, the mirror? Well, they're a lot more advanced than that. But they're now doing things like they have a live chat. If you're online and you're struggling, can't figure out how to, how to uh, enter the data, the little balloon will pop up and say, you seem to be having problems, can I help? Um, we, are, we, we no longer uh, time our customer service and you know it used to be a productivity issue that you were expected to handle so many consumers a day and if you weren't then you obviously weren't handling them efficiently or, or effectively now it's it's called stop the clock however long it takes to help that consumer you help that consumer the, the what you get rated on is at the end did did they have to come back to us or were you able to help them with that one call that one transaction and did they rate you at the end, not were you professional, not were you friendly, it's, it's called, a, it's the new thing in, in uh, um, customer service centers, by the way. It's called, a, oh, I'm losing the, the, what it's called. It's an uh, effort, an effort re uh, measurement. How hard was it to get what I wanted? And so what you're looking for is a low score rather than a high score. And so that's how we're now measuring our, our folks on, uh, on customer service. Okay, how long is information kept? This is probably one of the most frequently asked questions from Ask Experian. Um, and the, the important things here, and I think I covered this some more later, um, 
open accounts in good standing, you want to keep those accounts open if you can because if you close them, they will stay for 10 years, but they do disappear and length of history is important. So don't close those accounts unless, unless you have a good reason. Uh, later missed payments are seven years and it, the rule is, the, the law states it very comp uh, in a very complex way, but, but an easy way for consumers to understand it is it's seven years from the date of the first missed payment, which led to the status, okay? Seven years from the date of the first missed payment. And so that means um, I miss my payment on my, my U.S. bank card this month, but then I catch it up next month. Okay, well the whole account is not going to disappear seven years. Only that one missed payment will disappear seven years from that date. Okay, now let's say I miss a payment and then I never bring it current. I miss another payment, another payment, another payment. It's charged off. Okay, so when is that going to be deleted? Seven years from the first missed payment. I sell that account to a collection agency because Maxine was, you know, just just wasn't a bad a bad customer and didn't pay. When is that collection account going to be deleted? Seven years from the first missed payment which led to the collection. And I sell that collection account to another collection agency because Maxine's such a deadbeat she didn't pay them either. How, when's that second collection account going to be deleted? Seven years. Seven years from the first missed payment which led to the, to the status. Okay, so um, occasionally we, and that's required by law by the way now, we used to, to do that on our own to try to figure out that, um, that, that missed payment day, but now by law the last uh, FACT Act required collection agencies to re provide that original day to us. So it should be carried forward no matter what happens with the, with the uh, account. It's always going to be seven years. Uh, judgments uh, and bankruptcies, all public uh, record items are deleted based on the date of filing. So it doesn't matter, dismissed, whatever happens to it, paid, closed, whatever, it's always going to be based on the date of filing. And we delete Chapter 13 bankruptcies, even though the law says they can remain for 10 years, we actually delete them at seven years, and that's because of Chapter 13, of course, you have a repayment plan, so it, um, it's, it's a little bit different in significance than a Chapter 7 where you write everything off. Okay, and then unpaid tax liens, the law actually would require us to keep them for 15 years. We only keep them for 10 because California passed a law that limited it to 10, and so we just kind of applied that across the board uh, for consistency and, and less confusion. Um, but notice that that is the only item that, like if I, if I pay a collection account, when is it gonna be deleted? Seven years from the first <laughs> this payment. Um, so you know, the, oh, that's one of the biggest myths of like if I pay it, it's going to start the clock over, or if I make a payment, it's going to start the clock over. Doesn't happen. But a paid, unpaid tax lien can stay for ten years, but a paid tax lien can stay for seven years. It's the only time the clock restarts. So if you have a tax lien, you wait tw uh, nine years and then you pay it, it can stay another seven years. I know. So that's the only one, don't mess with mother IRS is the, the real message there. And then credit inquiries stay for two years um, even though they, they typically aren't scored for that long. But, and I think they're only required by law to be kept one year, but we keep two so the consumers have a, 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 a two-year record of who's access to report. Um, we, we don't store all that stuff. We, get, we hear about that from time to time. And also, of course, we don't have transaction data. People will talk about, you know, if you, have a problem on your on your statement, you know, that's going to show up in the credit report. Well, no, we don't know what you bought. We don't know if you bought a fur coat or a new tires. All we know is what, how much was charged on that credit card as a total. Um, common myths, uh, this, back when I started, this was one of the most common. People would get very upset with me. I paid it. I want you to take it off. And now more people really do understand that a credit report is a history. It's not just what's happened today. Um, the other thing that started that happened when I started is that l your your declination letters would literally say, "I'm sorry, I can't open that account for you because um, Experian um, told advised me to decline you." 
it literally would say that. And so <laughs> the law changed, and now you know that you're required to say based on information in, in the credit report. And I think it even requires you to say, and Experian won't be able to tell you why. But, uh, but, but basically, um, that, that's the important thing, is that we want you to tell the consumers uh, not only that you made the decision, but what factors in their credit history most impacted that decision. And some lenders still write and say, to find out those reasons, contact me, instead of just putting in the declination letter. I don't know if you do that or not, but, um, you know, so what happens is the consumers don't call you, they call us, and they expect us to tell them, and we don't know. Um, not responsible for those charges on our account, that's especially, that's true for the, uh, especially tr uh, important for young people who are going away to college, and they, if they even get a, a, a landline anymore, most don't. But if you know, if they do have a landline or they do have an apartment rent and their uh, lease, and they're both on there, one one roommate walks away, doesn't pay their share, and they go, well, it wasn't my my problem. Well, it doesn't matter. Their name's on the account. They're responsible for the whole thing. So. That's, that's a good message to make sure your kids understand. I already covered the divorce thing. The divorce decree is just between the two people. You've got to work out the deal with the creditors. Uh, consumers must give their permission for a report to be issued. The only case where that is true is um, employment, and there it requires a separate piece of paper. It can't be buried in the fine print. The consumer has to sign a piece of paper that says, um, I authorize you to pull my credit report. Um, they, uh, they still get this, that re requesting your own report and getting those pre-approved offers in the mail ruins your credit. And um, they aren't scored, they're only showed only to consumers. You know, we use the term soft inquiries and hard inquiries, do y'all hear that? Well, that's sort of the term that's been picked up in the in industry and consumers even are, are getting familiar with it. But a hard inquiry is one that shows on your credit report when others access it. It's when you've applied for new services and, uh, and it is a part of your history and it is scored. A soft inquiry show is captured, of course, because your credit report was accessed, but it shows only to you and it's never scored. And so the soft inquiries would be pulling your own report, a pre-approved offer, account uh, monitoring, where if y'all do account management where you, you monitor to change terms or whatever, um, insurance, employment, those are not new service related. Uh, okay, and then the big one, there's only one credit score and it's on every report. So how many of you know your credit score? Okay, so that was a real, actually a trick question. You don't have a credit score. <laughs> you have many credit scores and the numbers will be different. So even though you might know one of your scores, you do not know all of your scores. So let's look at what that means. Um, I use this because I, I I hear so much about credit scores from people who work with them. <laughs> but it says, this is from a mortgage person, I read in your column that stated a credit report score is not provided on my credit report. However, I work for a mortgage company and we receive credit scores from Experian on each credit report we request. This seems to be inconsistent. Can you please explain? That's a nice one. I got some that said things like, you call yourself an expert, you don't know what you're talking about. There is a score on every report I get. Okay. so. <sighs> brings me back to the elephant. The story is of the three blind men who were asked to describe an elephant. The first blind man t happened to touch the side of the elephant and he said an elephant is like the Great Wall of China. It's huge, it's hard, it's, it, it's a wall. The next uh, blind man happened to grab the leg of the elephant. He says, are you crazy? It's not like a wall, it's like a tree in the forest. And then the next blind man happens to Touch, grab the tail, and he goes, "Are you too crazy? It's not. It, it's like a rope. Uh, there's no. There's no substance to an elephant. It, there's just a simple rope, and it's all about the part that you touch. Well, mortgage lenders and you, and most of us, only touch one part of the credit report and score, and you think that's the universe. So what I want you to do today is to try to." to learn, the, get in touch with a whole elephant, to see the big picture and understand how it works from a consumer perspective and not just from your own business perspective. So that's setting the stage for that. So the first concept along those lines, and I have to pick on Brenda here, at dinner last night, she more than once referred to us as a credit rating company. 
Do you know who a credit rating company is? Standard and Poor's. <laughs> you know, they rate the credit of other companies, but you're right, FICO. FICO is, helps, um, helps determine the rating of the credit report. A credit reporting company only lays out the facts of your history. Even if you use an Equifax report that might be coded to say R9 or R8 or R whatever, that's not really a rating, that's just a code that says the same thing as 30 days later, 60 days later, 90 days late. It's, that's not rating it, it's just laying out the facts. So a credit report does not in any way say yes or no or maybe, just lays out the facts. And I fight this every day, especially with the media and even with our clients who write education material for consumers. They, they all ha tend to have that terminology of, well, the credit reporting company, um, you know, evaluates the, the inquiries in this way. We don't evaluate anything. We just lay out the facts. So from the beginning of time, you had to take the credit report and decide, what does that mean to me? Is this good? Is this bad? Do I say yes? Do I say no? And it, you, it started with, back in the, the, the my early days, that you had your own little scorecard. You had a little piece of paper and it said, how many times has this consumer been 30 days late? How many times has this consumer been 60 days late? How much total debt do they have, et cetera? And based on a, a lot of experience, you know, the, the people in the back room with the, you know, the green visor, they made personal decisions on that. Fortunately, over time, that process has been um, uh, um, made more, more accurate and efficient through technology and computers, and that's called a credit score. So what is a credit score? It's a tool that is applied to the credit report at the time of delivery. It's not a piece of data that's stored on the credit report, has no meaning tomorrow because if, you're, if anything in your credit report changed, then your score will likely change with it. Um, it's, it's really, really valuable because, like I said, the credit report doesn't tell you what to do. The score is what, to, what guides you. There are many different models with many different scales available from many different sources. FICO is obviously, you know, the gorilla in the room. They were one of the first um, to develop scoring models. They are the most widely used. Um, they, they have the greatest visibility, but they aren't the only game in town. There are, Experian has um, a score developing division. It's not part of the credit reporting, it's a separate division. So if somebody chooses to apply a, an Experian model, they choose it and it's added on. Um, there's Scoring Solutions, I think, is another company. And then there's Vantage Score, which I told you about that, that's invested in. But the other part of the many different scales available from many different sources is that FICO while they aren't very good about depicting this and when they speak about their scores, there is no the FICO score. There is no a FICO score. There are many different FICO scores and they have different, different ranges. Like I got my FICO score from Equifax um, to check it out and the range started at 280 and went up to eight something. Um, a lot of their, the scores that you hear about, that, you know, they say they start at 350 and go to 850, or that, but they have some models that go up to over 900. So if I tell you that your score is 720, that has no meaning because, oh, and the Vantage score, they came out uh, with Vantage score one, Vantage score two, they just released Vantage score three. Their range goes from 501 to 990. So if I have an 800 score, I have to know, was that, was that on a Vantage score? Where an 800 is a very low B, the way they did it, their numbering was so that 900s were like an A, that would be intuitive for consumers, 800s are like a B, 700C, uh, 600D, 500F, of course. Okay, so I have an 800. Well, with a Vantage score, I'm a very, very low B, you know, high C. But with, a, with a many of the FICO models, I am a very strong, you know, super prime perhaps. So the important thing is that you cannot focus on the number unless you, because you have to know the range for that score. And the number doesn't transfer. And do any of you know which of the FICO models? I know y'all use FICO. Which of your FICO models you use? Which of the FICO models? Any of you know? 
Okay, see, and most people don't. And one of the things I was just telling Brenda last night that we have to fight, um, a, a, and I have an associate. No, you know, it's all made at some corporate level back in the, you know, by the technician who sets up your systems. And, uh, and so, the, but the important thing for you to know is don't speak to your customers as if there's only one score and that once a consumer knows that number, that number's going to mean something to the next lender. Because very likely, I don't know, but very likely if you have an auto loan division, you're, that, that group is using a FICO score that's, that was customized for auto lending. There are scores that are customized for credit unions. There are scores that are customized for retail. Uh, there are insurance scores. There are um, uh, bankruptcy scores there that not just predict whether someone's going to not make a payment, but literally predict whether someone's going to file for bankruptcy. And quite honestly, it goes even beyond there. There are profitability scores. There are, you know, there's a bunch of different scores. So what role do we play in that? We don't score your report. You select which model you want us to apply, and as we deliver the report, we apply that model. In some cases, some of the big, big financial institutions don't use a FICO score or an experience score or a Vantage score or any. They, they develop their own custom score that they develop themselves. I mean, they've got technical resources to be able to develop their own score. So we don't even deliver it. We did deliver the credit report and they score it within their own system. Okay? And then in some cases, um, they may choose a, a, their, their, the model, but they don't have us apply it. They have their application system, third party processor apply it. So we don't, not only do we not know which score you used if a consumer comes to us, we don't have any way to, to we don't, it's the black box concept. We don't know the, the weight of the factors in that model or anything about it, okay? So we can't be the expert on that. If you, so I'll cover that in a minute. Okay, so what do consumers receive? When, when I talk about that they're gonna be exposed to different things, so please don't assume that they're gonna just always see the number that you see. If they come through annualcreditreport.com and they choose to add on a scoring service, which is, um, I think for Experian it's like $7.99, plus we have to collect tax in some states. Uh, at Experian and TransUnion, they will get the Vantage score, which I talked about goes up to $9.90. And interrupting myself here, but the Vantage score just came out with a VS3, and they changed to, I think it's like a 330 to 830 range, or, eight, or 350 to 850, something like that. So they, they kind of converted to a range that more consumers hear about because of mortgage reporting, because FICO is dumb. I mean, FICO is the only model used in mortgage reporting because of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So more consumers are exposed to those models than any others. But even there, not all, all lenders use the same FICO model, even for mortgage lending. Okay, so free credit, that's, um, and then Equifax, they do get a FICO model, but I think that's the one that got, starts at 280. Um, the freecreditscore.com, if they go there and buy our monitoring service, they are have unlimited access to a, a, an Experian Plus score. That's our own, our own custom model. Um, they also can be exposed to any number of different scores through third-party services, such as many big uh, financial institutions will offer a service through Experian, so they might get an Experian Plus score, they might get an, a TransUnion scored report, or, or, or they might go to uh, um, Quizzle. Have you heard of any of those? Quizzle and um, some of the others where online free credit report, free score things. Okay, mortgage lenders, like I said, use some kind of FICO model, and the lenders is required by Frank Dodd. Are y'all familiar with the Frank Dodd requirement for score disclosure? It was based on risk-based pricing, and it was if you're going to do risk-based pricing, you ha either have to um, disclose the score uh, to the consumers if you do, if you give them a higher rate than you give to anybody else, or you can disclose the score to any, all your consumers, all your customers, instead of just to the ones that get the higher. So, yeah, y'all are nodding, so I know y'all do that. But, so that means that your customers are getting disclosed to a scoring model. One of my problems with that is that it doesn't, it doesn't really explain that to consumers. It says to the consumer that this was based on a score, uh, this was based on information from Experian. 
it doesn't say it was based on a credit report from Experian, so that implies to the consumer that we're the ones who gave you the score and that we'll know all about it. Oh yeah, here it is. You can't read that, but it's in your, in your handout. Nowhere does it say it's based on a scoring model that ranges from here to here or that it, you know, it won't be the same number if you go somewhere else. It just it doesn't really educate consumers well at all. Uh, and by the way, after this, I would love to have feedback from any of you who work with that and work with consumers on what kind of feedback you're getting from consumers and what kind of questions because I thought there would be this huge, huge impact with consumers when they started getting disclosed those, those uh, getting those notices and that they would be, you know, hair on fire because they actually they do come to us hair on fire because they will get their score from one lender and then they will go to another lender and get a totally different score like it might be 40 points lower and they'll go I call us I've obviously been a victim of fraud because my score dropped overnight 40 points and it's just simply a different scoring model but I don't seem to be hearing much about for them Frank Dodd thing so um, anyway any of you who work with that I would love to to have some feedback from your customers on what's happening um, the these are the messages that I encourage lenders to use. You know, if, if you're going to disclose a score to, to consumers, they need to understand that it's not a part of the credit report. It is an add-on service. You pay additional for it, they have to pay additional for it, and, they, and they, somebody has to select which model is going to be disclosed. Um, okay, the free report, free score is an add-on service. Uh, consumer assistance representatives will not know which score was used by the lender or have access to the score. I already explained that. There are many different scoring models with many different scales from many different com companies. A number is only meaningful for a specific model and for that specific lender. Risk factors are the key. Every time you get a score, it will tell you what factors in your credit report most impacted that score because it's simply a reflection of, of what's in the, in the credit history. And so if you focus on those factors and change that behavior, then all of your credit scores will improve. And those factors are going to be relatively consistent across no matter which model is used. It may weight some things a little bit more than others, but basically, you know, if your balances are too high, your balances are going to be too high on every score. If your missed payments are there, then your missed payments are going to be there for every score. Okay. I, this is not something I normally put in for consumers, but I think it's important for, for uh, in case you don't understand the whole concept of how scores are developed, because I get a lot of, well, it doesn't make sense to me that inquiries are matter, or it's not fair to consumers that you consider this in scoring models. And th the, the real answer to that is that it's not a person who decides if something um, is important or not important. It's a real experience because the way scoring models are developed is they take a snapshot in time of a very large number of consumers and they then take those same consumers a year later or two years later and they see how they've performed over time. And so then they go back and look at what they started and they then know that consumers who have characteristics like this are very likely, very, very high percentage of the time, going to end up performing like this. And the ones who look like this are very, very likely to end up performing like that, okay? So, so they can identify all those characteristics that were linked together that caused um, the consumer to, to score that way. And that's how they, they put weighting on the different factors and, and they, they end up producing the score. And, and I've said, you know, FICO has many different models. Uh, someone who, uh, John Oldheimer, who used to work for FICO, has said they have like 49 different models. I think that includes not only do they have, have a, a large number of just different models, you know, the auto lending, the generic, several generics that have, have been changed over time, et cetera, but they also, when they're applied to each credit reporting company, there are there are uh, variances in the scoring models as well because they use different data. The Vanity Score, by the way, one of the advantages of it is that they pulled exactly the same data from all three credit reports, credit reporting companies, and they normalized it so that if a consumer has exactly the same information in all three credit reports, they will get exactly the same Vantage score. And that doesn't normally happen with a FICO score because it was, they were developed using different data. But anyway, the, the point is that 
a, a credit, they keep developing new scoring models, and a scoring model reflects what's really happening in the industry at the time, in the marketplace, I should say, at the time. And I use this as a great example because this was the Vandy Score 2 model, which came out right after the financial crisis. You know, 2008, when everything crashed and nobody was giving any credit, nobody was doing car loans, and all the A uh, consumers the, with the very best scores just stopped applying for credit. Just, if they got the offers, they, they didn't want them. Everybody just kind of pulled down. And so, and then what happened is all the, cons the consumers who were low, had really low scores, and who needed, wanted new credit, they couldn't get it. They would get turned down. And so they started hitting everybody they knew. They would apply with U.S. Bank, get turned down. They'd apply for the next bank, get turned down. Apply for the next bank, get turned down. So as a result, got to find it, recent credit became a huge factor that was associated with negative credit. And that's a pure reflection of the marketplace of what was happening at the time. Now things have started to open back up and, you know, and people are more willing to approve them maybe at, with higher terms, but not as many are, are one applying or two getting turned down. Now this is the one that Vantage Square that just came out. It's not even going into effect until April. But look at recent credit on that chart compared to that chart. That's a reflection that now, with the way the marketplace is, that's not such an important factor that you've just recently opened a new account or that because, because everybody's applying for credit again uh, more normally. Uh, The, um, in the brochure that we have, we have the pie chart for FICO, and we also talk about you know, what, what influences your score. So I asked for a new pie chart. You saw that little circle? And I didn't get the pie chart, and they said, we're really, really resisting that. And I go, boo, everybody loves the pie chart. They really want to know, what, you know what, what, how much weight do you put on each thing? And they said, well, it, it misinforms consumers because consumers then take it literally. They think that 46% of their score is going to be based on, on uh, missed payments. They think that you know 30% is going to be based on this. Or, you know, and it, that's just not the way it works because pe different people have different kinds of credit reports. And it, the, the weighting varies significantly depending on the other factors in your credit report. You know, if I only have two accounts, and I miss a payment on one, then that's probably going to count a whole lot more uh, percentage-wise than if I have, like Maxine, a long, rich history of 30 accounts and I miss a payment. You know, that's going to be a much smaller percentage. Does that make sense to you? So it's kind of misleading consumers to make them think that they can just do a magic, it's this percent. So what, what Vantage Score wants us to do, move toward in our education, is to, to put relative value on things, like that your payment history is the most important thing that you can do, that your age and type of credit is helpful, and the percent of credit limit used. Now, a lot of the, the models put an even higher <coughs> emphasis on this versus this. Um, and and that is, that's called your utilization, and, and people go, oh, that's a term you shouldn't use with consumers, but more and more consumers are actually hearing it and understanding it, and it's the easiest way for me to explain it. Your utilization is your, how much you owe on your credit, credit cards compared to how much you could owe, and those credit, credit scoring models, which, which look at how real consumers behave, have shown that consumers who charge to the max are the highest risk. If you, are, if you are running your balances up to the maximum, then, um, then very likely you're at risk, you're in trouble. Uh, so total balances and, and total debt, available credit, and that's one of those, um, it used to be way back that people would say close all your unused accounts because it shows you have all, all this unused credit and you could go out tomorrow and charge another $10 or have another $10,000 in debt and so that's a risk factor. And they, it, the score miles still look at that of how much available credit you have but it's a very, it, it's not nearly as important as all these other things. And then the, the last one is your recent credit behavior and inquiries. Now that includes if you've recently opened an account that will cause your score to be lower, but only if it's recent. 
and that's because you just haven't had time to show um, you know, how you're going to manage it. But the reason inquiries are scored, and there's, there's always a move in Congress that, that we should be limited and uh, eliminated, should not allow inquiries to be included because they don't think it's right. And once again, it's one of those, but experience shows <laughs> it is important. But um, that what they did pass was a law that said if inquiries are a factor at all, a negative factor, then they have to be included in the factors provided to the consumer, even as if you have to add on a fifth factor. Normally you do like four factors that most influence the score. So what's happened is more, uh, almost every consumer who has a recent inquiry is getting informed that the inquiry caused a negative impact. Well, two things. It's only there, like I said, because we're required. Um, they only are impact if they're recent because that means that you have recently applied for a new account which may not have had time to show up in your credit history and you may have taken on new debt. So, so that's why a recent inquiry is impactful. But the other is that, um, is that it's required to be there and it's only a few points. So even if you have recent inquiries, it, it can be five, ten points at most and they quickly go down one to two months, you know, one to three months, three to six months and you know, very sometimes scored six to up to twelve months but almost nothing there. So I get these consumers, you know, hair on fire that I got turned down because of my inquiries. Trust me, you did not get turned down because of your inquiries. You got turned down because you had missed payments, you had too much debt, you had all these other reasons, and the inquiries might have been this little bitty factor. So my, my message to consumers is, yes, they have a small impact, and if you're marginal, or if you're going to be applying for a rate-sensitive loan, like a mortgage or an auto, where every point counts, you don't go and apply for anything in the, in the three to six months before um, before you're going to get that rate sensitive loan. Just you know, don't don't even lose a point by that. But don't if you have good credit, don't worry about inquiries. If you get a store account that you get a 20% discount and you're not going to overcharge on it, then go for it because you know you can save that money and the inquiry is really not that important. So my ten rules um, for managing. Credit are establish a credit report, pay as agreed, get a credit card, use caution in closing accounts. And why is it, what, what's the negative of closing an account? I, I get out, this is a myth all the time. Like people will advise to improve your credit, close all your unused accounts. Why is that bad advice? Well, it screws up your utilization then. Exactly. Because the way scoring models work is they score each individual card. So if I have one card with a $10,000 limit and I owe $8,000, my, my utilization is 80%. But if I have four more cards, so I have a total of $50,000 in limit and I owe $8,000, then I'm only eight on 50. So I have a very low utilization. So it doesn't, you know, it's a negative for that one card, but that's greatly offset by the, when it combines them all together. Make sense? Uh, Time is the key. If you've missed a payment, you can't do a thing about it, and credit repair organizations can't help. Demonstrate stability, and that's the way I use it to explain to consumers about don't open accounts, close accounts, uh, uh, apply for new accounts, or anything right before a rate sensitive loan because you want your credit to stabilize. It's a little bit more complicated than that because of their scorecards. And, and uh, I'm talking with Brenda last night about consumers will say, well, I paid down my balances, which is probably the one thing that most consumers can do to improve their scores if they need to because you can't make missed payments go away. And then the second most important factor is utilization. So if I pay down those, those balances, my score is going to go up. Okay, for some consumers, their score will go down. <laughs> so it's, it's because of the whole mix of their credit, but what happens is they move into a different scorecard, and that I don't ever even try to explain that to consumers, but so you understand, that's why the way I explain it is just be stable. You know, make all your changes, open those new accounts to increase your, your utilization, I mean, improve your utilization, uh, close accounts if you need to close any, do whatever you're going to do, and then let your credit report stabilize for three to six months so you don't get that little movement at the last minute um, that's going to impact your mortgage. Um, have a plan. If you do carry balances, you just got to have a plan and, and pay it off. And then put credit to work for you. And that's, that's my, I think, you know, people who don't use their credit cards for all those great advantages I covered earlier, I think you're just not very smart about using credit. Like what a deal that a credit card can be for you if you can manage yourself with it. 
if you can't manage yourself with it, if you're going to be tempted to overspend, better not to have a credit score. Better to have no, uh, no credit report. I mean, well, you'll have a credit report. But better, I don't care if you have a bad credit score, if you, if you aren't managing, if you're using your credit cards to get yourself into debt, because that's the worst thing. It's more important than your scores or anything else because it affects your whole life and your emotions and your family and your, you know, your job performance and everything else. So your number one priority is not your credit score, it's that you manage your money well. And then share your knowledge, of course, is what I've already talked about, not only with, uh, with the world, but especially with your kids. Um, I, I, don't, I don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but just one of the progress that we've made. Are we, we're well past break. No, we're not. We're okay. Uh, we're not taking a break. Okay. Um, Y'all just taking a break. One of the uh, uh, things that we've made real progress on is when we started with Congress and, and the FACT, uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act amendments and then the FACT Act and all the things that regulate us. By the way, we're almost as regulated as you, not quite, <laughs> but we have a lot of regulations. Um, is that they kept wanting to regulate that we had to disclose a score, for example, and you're still hearing that. Bernie Sanders is, is on the bandwagon of those credit reporting companies should disclose the score. And it's because they, the, those people who are promoting that think there is just one score and it's on the credit report and we just aren't sharing it. So, um, but the CFPB has actually made progress in really understanding you know, how SCORE is a separate thing and it's applied, it's a tool, and, uh, and that there are many of them. So, uh, so that's one point of progress. And they also um, put out a study, they did a correlation between scoring models and um, the, the, the media came out with um, you know, 20% of consumers, the scores are not consistent, but the positive side of it is 80%, they're very, very consistent. So like I said, if you just focus on your factors that, that are causing you the problem, change that behavior, then all of your scores will go up. This is just for fun, uh, <laughs> and this I use because of the old, uh, you know, if people were having to, re you know, scoring is not fair because it's a mystery, it's a secret, you know, you, you say it's in a black box so you can't understand it, and what I say is, well, okay, let's take away scores and let's just have a person decide because that's what happened before scoring, and if you think that's more fair and you will understand better their thinking of why they approved you or didn't approve you, go for it, you know, <laughs> let's go back in history to that time. So this demonstrates that you cannot go uh, you cannot determine, uh, um, evaluate people and their risk based on how they look because you know, this, this guy, uh, the Vantage Score A, the most common characteristics associated with the Vantage, uh, uh, Vantage Score A are things like Facebook, games, addicting games, Craigslist, etc. And the Vantage Score F, the things that were most associated with them in our searches, by the way, we have an, another business that does all, all this online uh, analysis. Um, Facebook, degree info, and job radar, etc. So again, don't don't stereotype people. Okay. Can I ask, I'm not sure if I understood what that meant. So those are sites that they're participating in. Yes. When we when we compared credit scores to on-site visits, those were the Vantage Score F. Characteristics, those were advantage score A characteristics. It's possible that they just spend more on their clothes. I got to check that out too. I don't know what that is. Uh -huh. And then also, just for fun, this is in the Dallas area. But they gave me this, since I've been so heavy with all this other content, they looked at um, what people do online searches for. And the A people, number one is boxing. Like, who? 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 <laughs> Who looks at boxing? I was like, really? But anyway, track and field, utilities, tennis, airlines, cruises. These are these are um, uh, habits and you know and interest that are associated with A. And then the F. Now this was much more to me, much more predictable. Uh, mobile phone searches, colleges, employment, gambling, uh, legal assistance. 
Uh -huh. College, I, yeah, but that made sense because young people, you know, without, uh, without good credit. Um, Auto dealerships, video games, health and medical. I thought that was interesting. And then the one, uh, another one where they, uh, their artist, the artist that they, <laughs> Yo Yo Ma. Uh, I, I have to tell you one more. I, I didn't include it. I couldn't remember if I had included it. The other one that they looked at was television shows uh, for, uh, um, like, what do you call the super Democrats, the you know, very far left Democrats. Their, their um, shows were just what you would expect. It was the uh, John Stewart show, Glee, uh, Modern Family, uh, uh, Co Stephen Colbert. Okay. The liberal, <laughs> the far super conservative, what, three of the top ten were ESPN one, f football, college football, ESPN two, college football, <laughs> ESPN three, They're like, it was one, number one, number five, and number ten was all football. But another one that was really interesting that was on there was Kathy Lee and Hoda. That's in the category of age. That was actually uh, super prime, I mean, um, super conservative. That didn't have anything to do with, with risk scores. That's why I didn't include it. But I just thought, really? Kathleen Hoda? Okay.